Buenas tardes. Vamos a empezar ya con la última sesión, por favor, y, y entrando y sentando. No, no, sit down here, you want. And now, Vera. Are you talking Spanish or, yeah? Hola, buenas tardes. Bien, para mí este honor que me concede la organización del Congreso, Ricard, Carlos, de presentar a Jonathan Larsen, pues la verdad es que es un, para mí es un privilegio. ¿no? Pero no quiero empezar a la presentación, que va a ser extraordinariamente breve porque vamos ya pasados de tiempo por todas partes, sin hacer una alusión a, a lo que significa para alguien que, como yo, lleva ya unos cuantos años dedicado al estudio del turismo, lo que significa este congreso. Quiero agradecer de un modo muy especial a Ricard y a, y a Carlos que hayan montado todo esto, que lo hayan organizado y, sobre todo, la sensibilidad y la preocupación por llevar el estudio del turismo al ámbito de la arquitectura y del urbanismo. Esto creo que merece la pena resaltarlo y, sobre todo, por esa idea de transversalidad. Durante muchos años, me he dedicado a esto y quiero decir que es lo que hemos anhelado muchos, esa necesaria transversalidad en el estudio y en la investigación sobre turismo. Por tanto, desde esos eh, argumentos, desde esos ámbitos, creo que bien merece la pena resaltar lo que hoy se va a hacer y se está haciendo aquí y en, y en estos días. Gracias, por tanto, por todo ello. Bien, mi papel aquí es presentar a una autoridad en un tema que es, creo que la relevancia está fuera de toda duda. Joran Larsen es profesor de movilidad y de estudios urbanos en la Roskilde University de Dinamarca. Es autor de obras de referencia, obras de referencia sobre la mirada de la ciudad, la mirada turística y sobre todo esa obra que, bueno, pues creo que marca una pauta en, el, en, este, en este tema, que es eh, la mirada turística 3.0 con John Harry. Eh, además, ha publicado artículos en revistas como Annals, Tourist Studies, Mobilities, etc. El otro día se me ocurrió mirar en Google Scholar, en Google el Académico, las referencias del profesor, del profesor Jonas Larsen y, bueno, eran 5.000 no sé cuántas, lo cual testimonia que su obra, siendo como es una persona joven, que su obra es muy citada y muy eh, habitual en los eh, trabajos y en las investigaciones que se vienen haciendo. Sin más preámbulos, que esperar que esta, que esta charla nos resulte muy útil a todos, pues Jonas, Jonas, es un verdadero placer presentarte y tienes la palabra cuando quieras. Thanks so much for um, this nice uh, introduction and not least, uh, thank you for inviting me and I'm really, really happy to, um, to be here and partaking in this um, exciting um, conference. And um, I'm looking forward to the day and sorry for speaking so late. I hope it's okay in Denmark, you know, everyone would have been on a strike so late, but I know it's div different rhythms and that's partly what I like about traveling. So I'm really excited. Um, And I think we are all here. <clears throat> um, Ricard asked me to um, talk about my work together with um, John Ori in relation to the tourist case, and um, I'm really happy to um, talk about that work. But I will partly also um, go beyond that work and in the end today um, talk about my more recent work which is actually very much kind of focusing on landscapes and it's trying to, to bring out a different account of landscapes than what is proposed by the tourist case, which is very much kind of looking at or gazing upon landscapes and bringing about a more kind of physical approach to, to landscapes where we are being touched by landscapes and so on and so forth. And in some ways, it's, it's also... Um, a great privilege of mine to, um, to do this talk, you know, um, after Dean McKinnon, because in many ways, when I was um, a student, um, the two first books I read on tourism was The Tourist Gaze and The Tourist. So it's kind of nicely kind of bringing it all together. 
Uh, and sadly, as I'm sure most of you are aware, John Ory passed away um, almost two years ago. So um, it's also a bit like talking about his kind of his legacy, um, I guess, to, um, to tourism studies and beyond. So um, the talk is called The Tourist Gaze 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and kind of beyond. So it's not really going to be a 4.0. Um, I'm sometimes getting that question, but I think it would be odd to make a new version of the book without John. Um, all right. So um, John Ory was uh, always ahead of everybody else in discovering new and exciting research fields. And I think the tourist case is an early example of this. Prior to this book, few sociologists had taken tourism seriously or noted its growing significance around the world. There were some great books around at the time. I think Dean McCannell's is perhaps the best example of that. But the tourist case uh, must be read as an attempt to establish a sociology of tourism. And that was actually this, um, the, the title that John was working with until um, the editor was suggesting that, you know, the tourist case is a much better title. It's also tying into the earlier discussion today by Dean McKenna, I think, important to note is that John had a kind of critical approach to tourism. It was not a kind of a celebration of tourism. It was about, you know, trying to understand what tourism is doing to us as people, but also how it has an effect on places. So that was this kind of, also kind of critical approach to it. And tourism, it seemed at that time, this kind of frivolous world of pleasures and carefree leisure, was not an appropriate subject matter for a serious sociologist. And I think John Ari was clearly aware of this. On the first pages of the book, he's almost apologizing for writing a book about this seemingly trivial subject matter. And yet he speculates, and I quote him, that sociology might have great difficulties in accounting for holiday making as sociologists struggle to write about pleasure and fun. I think this kind of knowledge gap and intellectual, um, um, an intellectual challenge triggered John's interest in tourism. However, John was also aware, in part because of his locality studies in the 80s in the northwest of the UK, that, tourist, that tourism was increasingly central to much social, cultural and economic life, as well as to the rise and fall of cities and built environments. Travel and tourism was already a significant phenomenon and the impact would only increase in the decades to come. Few concepts steaming from, and here we've got John, um, I think, nice picture. Um, few concepts steaming from tourism research are more cited and employed than the tourist case, both within tourist studies and I think importantly outside tourist studies. And I think its success in terms of impact uh, is down to several partly interlinked factors. Firstly, it illustrates the significance of a good book title. So if you're doing a PhD, listen carefully here. <laughs> um, John Norris' book, The Tourist Case, is famous for the idea of the tourist case, despite the fact that it actually covers much more ground. The concept and the title we may say nicely support each other, and when we think of the tourist case, we kind of automatically think of John Norris. No other tourist scholar has had quite such a monopoly over a concept and a powerful brand. Secondly, Ori writes in a clear and kind of fluid language. And since photographing, sightseeing, and sight are everywhere in the spaces of tourism, there's a way in which the notion of the tourist gaze makes sense intuitively. Thirdly, as kind of hinted upon, John Ari is much more than a tourism scholar, nor is he like the tourist who resigned to the same place year after year. He was one of Europe's leading social scientists with an incredible eye for 
discovering new kind of societal problems. His kind of sociological gaze seemed to be forever on the move. He was like the adventurous traveler that goes to new places before the masses went there. But once he reported from there, many would follow in his footstep. And since then, Ari has co-authored, edited a number of tourism books. Um, but he has mainly traveled elsewhere, writing about nature, mobilities, globalization, complexity theory, cars, aeromobilities, mobile methods, places, and more recently about climate change, oil, and offshoring. Um, Many of these debates, to some degree, came to be incorporated into the later versions of the tourist case. Um, a new chapter was added in the 2002 version, the 2.1, or the 2.0 version, and in 2011, the 3.0 version, uh, where John invited me on board as a co-author we did um, quite a lot of editing of the old chapters and then added three new chapters. And as I said, uh, in this talk, I want to kind of talk you through these kind of three moments of the tourist case and kind of give a kind of account of this kind of double movement of how the tourist case as a concept is on the move and how it is reflected in how John himself were on the move. But it's also a kind of, I guess, to a certain degree, a kind of, a account of how tourism study has kind of changed over the time, as in particular that the third edition of the tourist case kind of incorporates much of the criticism that has indeed been raised against the tourist case. Uh, it is in many ways a kind of contested and highly um, debated concept. Um, and as I said, I will also talk about some of the criticism, and then I will end my whole talk by discussing how I am in my own more recent research on, on, on mobility in relation to cycling and running, are moving, moving, so to say, beyond the tourist case as I'm becoming increasingly interested in more kind of multi-sensors encounters, in particular with landscapes and places. And partly, I guess, because I'm, I'm, I'm s s s dissatisfied with the notion of kind of landscape as a thing we only kind of look at. Just give me two seconds, please. <coughs> All right. So um, the 1.0 version. Um, the tourist case, the first version, is essentially an account of how modern tourism became organized <coughs> around a core set of new institutions, ideologies, and practices, and not least how vision and visual technologies such as photography produce new and exciting ways of looking at and visual appreciating landscapes and architecture as aesthetically pleasing and spectacular. Tourism became materially and discursively designed as a way of seeing, and this kind of mirrors the general kind of um, Western preference towards vision as discussed by Foucault and others. And this kind of system approach that was so central to John Orris Later's mobility thinking is also kind of very clear in, in the tourist case as, as different tourist cases are set to be organized, patterned, and systemized by various discourses, material relations, social groups, and environments. So we might say that tourists do not um, gaze by chance. While not authorized by a single knowledge generating institution like the case of the medic discussed by Foucault, the various cases of tourists are discursively organized by many professionals over time. So in the early days, we might talk about romantic poets and as we heard about earlier today, painters and so on, photographers, guides, tour operators, heritage industry, and so on and so forth. Ari also speaks about a kind of vicious hermeneutic circle in the first edition. 
to capture this kind of discursive framing or choreographed nature of gazing. Those effectively tourists gaze upon places that they have already consumed in image form. So we might say that gazing is about consuming and photographing signs or markers. And to some degree, at least, tourists are framed and fixed rather than framing and exploring. And part of the tourist gaze is the idea that gazing is kind of mediated by specific representations and technologies. And we might think of like the photography reading, and the guidebook reading, and the photography taking tourists as a kind of the personalization of the tourist gaze. And I think. Um, I don't hope Martin Parr will be too upset about me using his photograph here today, but um, I don't know if you know Martin Parr, um, a British photographer who has extensively photographed tourists um, taking photos or uh, visually consuming places, and I guess to some degree it kind of brings out the significance of, of markers or signs in um, in highlighting how places should be seen, what places should be seen, and so on. So if Foucault plays the kind of d disciplining uh, part in the tourist case, then postmodernism, this kind of intellectual hipster of the 80s and 90s, plays the more playful one. Postmodernism undermines the distinction between representation and reality. We kind of set to live in an age where we are oversaturated with images, um, where representations are everywhere, everywhere and often more exciting than reality. And the gaze, according to John, is not least postmodern because it implies that tourists are folded into a world of text, images, and representational technologies when they are gazing upon landscapes. Indeed, tourists often travel to places that are made special or extraordinary through media. And tourists, we may say, are traveling in media scapes as much as physical worlds, and they largely um, appreciate them through the visual sense. And this is the kind of controversial and generalizing part of the book. I think that has made the book famous and also, as I said, kind of contested. The Tourist Gates 2.0. The, uh, the, uh, the, the newness of the second version of the Tourist Gates that were published in 2002 um, was, was actually only a, a new chapter. There was hardly done any editing to that version. And that was a chapter called Globalizing the Gaze. And that chapter must be seen in relation to Oris' edited book on touring cultures with Chris Rojak. And also, not least, his kind of his interest at the time in uh, formulating a mobilities paradigm for the social sciences. So increasingly, we may say that his when he was interested in tourism, it was related to a much broader framework of mobility. Also, at that time, he came out with a book called um, Global Complexity. So. Ori, he was formulating a sociological manifesto for our globalized age of people, things, um, the internet information, and much more. And in that chapter, John Ori writes that the world has become much more mobile and globalized. And this to an extent, and this to an extent that he speaks of global tourism. He argues, and I quote him now, that there are countless ways in which huge uh, numbers of people and places get caught up within the swirling uh, vortex of global tourism. These are not two separate entities, the global and tourism, bearing some external connection with each other." End of quote. And he's kind of particularly bringing attention to the fact that in the first edition of the tourist case, there was, there, was, there was no such thing as the internet, but he's kind of bringing out in that new chapter the significance of the internet and what it is doing to tourism. And he particularly discussed that in relation to virtual travel and what he kind of called communicative travel. 
So he's arguing that there are now many more screens now allowing virtual gazing. And yet there's also more corporal travel due to cheap flights, more airports, and more destinations. He also introduces the notions of corporal proximity and compulsion to proximity to highlight that tourists travel long distances and pay much money to experience places kind of corporally. Virtual travel, he argues, is a poor substitute for the sensuous richness of corporal travel. So he writes, and I quote him again, to be there oneself is what is crucial in most tourism. Co-present then involves seeing or touching or hearing or smelling um, or tasting a particular place, end of quote. He also notes how much tourism uh, revolves around family life and friendship as much network ties are not just around the corner but at a distance. And this highlights how much tourism involves a combination of places and significant people. And it's kind of interesting if you're looking at the tourist case, there's hardly any discussion of sociality of traveling. There's almost this kind of implicit assumption that people are flaneurs that are going around gazing at the world, not really uh, hindered by, for example, family members. Um, okay. So this highlights how much tourism those involves, uh, or I said that, so Europeans travel to see their parents in their old hometown or their migrated parents, or uh, migrated parents here in Spain, or their best friend now living in China, or an old university friend who is lecturing in the UK, or their daughter, story, uh, 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 daughter studying in Berlin. So when tourists visit friends and kin, they simultaneously travel to particular places that are experienced through their um, social networks and the kind of accumulated network of the local scene or of pertinent landscapes. And I think here we should kind of begin to note how Ori begins to move away from the idea that the visual sense is kind of dominating the other senses or that we only travel to see the world. He's also paying quite a lot of attention to how the late 90s and early, uh, um, um, the early part of the new century was a kind of a decade or a period of unprecedented levels of global mobility. He knows how far more places are now part of global tourism. This includes places that are distant, places that are thought to have little tourist appeal, and this is part of a kind of reflexive process whereby places and nations enter a kind of neoliberal order where places compete with each other to kind of attract business people and tourists. Not least does it discuss how budget airlines have made travel, air travel cheap and easy. In Europe, Berlin, Paris and London have become kind of we can play around to what we might call the easy jet generation. Overall, travel time and cost has reduced within past decades, so frictions of, of, of distance and cost of travel only partly matter in relation to physical travel. So many more places are within reach cheaply and quickly. As a consequence, Many people have become kind of used to a mobile lifestyle and a kind of touristic cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan outlook that presuppose, presupposes much travel. This also means that, and this is something that is only he touches upon in, in the book, in, in that chapter, but it also means that tr tourists are no longer confined to out of the way enclaves. Tourists want to go beyond the enclave and the usual sites. They have a desire to move into a gaze upon what Tim Edenso has called heterogeneous tourist places. 
And this is kind of tying into more kind of recent um, literature on what has been called new urban tourism, um, in particular referring here to the work of Maitland. And, um, and he's arguing that we see a proliferation of kind of new urban tourism in kind of gentrified hipster areas such as Brooklyn, uh, Kreuzberg, Neukölln, East London, Berlin might all, uh, sorry, um, and, um, and Vesterbo in Copenhagen where I live. And I would argue that new urban tourism is a reflection of cultural globalization and what we might call kind of hipstification and a new generation of competent and frequent travelers. Western tourists increasingly feel at home outside enclaves, enclaves at least in the, in the Western world, because such neighborhoods resemble each other. You will roughly find the same type of bar, roughly the same type of coffee bars, record shop, vintage shops, people, clothing, hairstyles in the neighborhood discussed in a new urban tourism literature. So this kind of cultural um, um, homogeneity in these places is not only caused by kind of Starbucks, but it's also kind of much more kind of kind of underground um, globalization, I think is quite interesting. Okay, moving on to, um, how are we doing on time? To the third edition. So much happened between 2000 and 2011 when the third edition was published. In the field of tourism studies, there was quite a lot of, um, a great deal of talk about replacing kind of the tourist gates with a new paradigm of, of performing. And this kind of paradigm suggests that the doings of tourism are kind of physical, physical and corporeal and not merely visual. Um, the tourist case was critiqued for reducing the significance of tourism to, to, to sightseeing. Where are the other senses, bodily experiences and adventure, the critics, critic asked. And I was actually one of the critics. John Ory continued his work on developing the new mobilities paradigm, but now in a much more critical, bleak, and pessimistic tone, I think. And he increasingly began to spilling out the many social, economic, and environmental problems that you know, excessive mobilities generated such as surveillance, overconsumption, over-tourism, and not least climate change. I think, you know, in, in relation to the discussion on earlier today, I think in many ways John's later work became much more concerned with the ethics of tourism. And in the end of the day, literally asking us whether there could be such thing as ethical tourism not least in knowing that the impact flying has on the environment. Allow me now to be a little bit personal. I don't know if you have ever uh, received an email from John Ari, but if you have, you would, you would have noticed that he wrote his email in a very kind of short kind of Twitter way, so it was straight to the point. Um, so I was kind of surprised when I, in 2009, received a quite lengthy email from John Ari, and I was kind of equally puzzled when he wrote that Sait had approached him to do a new edition of the tourist case, uh, and he was kind of unsure about um, doing a new edition, I think partly because he he was kind of intellectually engaged in other debates, and also he wrote to me and said that he was kind of thinking that the structure of the book was cracking a little bit, and he was unsure about whether kind of it would make sense to incorporate in, you know, all the kind of debates and the criticism against the tourist gaze into the book. But then apparently he had thought to himself with whom have I worked most on tourism lately and with whom would it be funny to write a new edition with? And apparently that person was me. 
So uh, he asked me if I could be interested and he wouldn't be offended if I turned down the offer to be the co-author of the new version. And I was like, yes, I'm off for that. So I was, of course, like happy. And I replied, said, yeah, I could be off for that. Um, at that time, I was living in Denmark. John was living in Lancaster. For our first meeting in, um, it was actually, I think it was in Copenhagen, John prepared himself by reading and scribbling a book version of the second edition on a long haul journey. And it turned out that John's scribbles suggested much deletion, rewriting, new ideas, and studies to incorporate. He kind of realized that the first two editions focused on the northwest of England and contained many outdated case studies that ought to be replaced with cases from around the world. And whereas the 2.0 version kind of speaks about the kind of the necessity of travel, in the 3.0 version, he wished to stress how tourism mobility has become excessive, a kind of consumer addiction, much, much like much else in a neoliberal world. And he was kind of, he was kind of keen on talking about your theories about Bain's mobility, this idea that you know, we have a need to travel, that it's okay to travel around the world, on, on numerous occasions, um, and so on and so forth. And um, he was also very preoccupied with Dubai. He had a kind of obsession with Dubai, and whereas like the one old version was very much an account of the Northwest, the rise of the Northwest, you know, Morecambe, for example, Blackpool, these places, but also their fall, precisely because these places were negatively affected when Brits were moving to, or not moving to at least, but traveling to where we are today, Costa del Sol. So there was this idea that, you know, that these places were, were their fate were interlinked. But the free version was about this rise of Dubai, this kind of luxury, luxury island of excessive consumption in, in the desert. And also there was in that book, and I think this is also coming into his much more kind of bleak analysis of tourism, he was very much arguing for the kind of the need to what he would call tame the tourist case, make it more local, make it less dependent upon air travel, kind of reinvent, redesign kind of new forms of tourism that are less harmful to the environment. Um, yeah, for example, talking about you know de-exoticizing the tourist case. He was also very supportive of of my kind of sus uh, substantive, substantive sorry list of suggested alterations to the existing chapters. So we kind of began to realizing that maybe the book would be actually be revised quite a lot, and we also agreed on writing three new chapters. And um, the key challenge, as we saw it, was to find a right balance between defending and yet rethinking the tourist case in light of the kind of the recent kind of performance turn and other criticism kind of raised against the tourist case over the years. Um, and especially like the tourist case suggested that the tourist case were outdated and ought to be replaced with a much more kind of dynamic, processual, and multi uh, multi account of, 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 of doing tourism. And this kind of concerned me how we would strike that balance. And the way forward it occurred to me was to kind of integrate the paradigms of the gaze and performance within a kind of single framework and kind of rethink the case in that way. And um, John agreed, so the tourist case ended up rethinking the tourist case as a kind of performative embodied practice where tourists were framed by discourses and images but were not kind of determined by them. So it's trying to bring out much more kind of certain much more agency, much more kind of 
um, embodiment, lots more kind of performances. And in the free old version, we also began to kind of noticing the limits to the tourist gaze. What can it not explain? Saldana have asked, and I quote here, don't tourists swim, climb, stroll, ski, relax, become bored, perhaps all? Don't they go to other places to taste, smell, listen, dance, get drunk, have sex? End of quote. Yes, they do. Tourists do ex eat exotic food, smell new odors, touch each other, are touched by the sun, um, dance to pulsating soundscapes, talk with friends, and occasionally get blind drunk. Flowers, touches, smells, and sounds, doing and acting can also produce difference and the extraordinary. And kinesthetic pleasures are omnipresent in tourism. Think about walking a mountain, cycling in nature, diving in the sea, playing on the beach with your kids, skiing down the Alps, or raving through the night. But we're still making the argument that tourist places, that, that many tourist places are designed according to a logic of visualism and in that process tend to suppress or control the other senses and that the visual sense is normally the organizing sense within tourist experiences as we kind of in the book discuss in relation to cameras, photographs, advertising and theme spaces. While the visual sense is clearly not the only sense, we may argue that it is often the organizing sense. It organizes the place, role, and effect of other senses. This, this, the distinctiveness of the visual is crucial for giving all sorts of practices and performances a special or unique character. The most mundane of activities, such as shopping, strolling, having a drink, or swimming, or river rafting, appear extraordinary and become touristic when conducted against a striking or unusual visual uh, backcloth. In the Tourist Guest Frio, we put forward a relational approach that acknowledges, and yet we, we put forward a relational approach that acknowledges the complex intersections of the senses in people's visual encounters with places. So we kind of argue for a census analyze of tourism and look at the relationship between normally dominant visualism and the other senses, including various kinds of movement. So there's this idea that the performed tourist case is never just eyes, it involves the whole body, um, and that gazing is kind of multimodal. And we also kind of discuss how gazes are never disembodied traveling eyes. If gazes are not bodied to do well, having a hangover or having whatever, uh, they, may feel, they may fail to be impressed by the sight. Similar impressive sight may be contradicted or by inappropriate smells or noises. And we also bring out um, some of the social relations of gazing. And we discuss how tourists never just gaze upon places and things. Tourists gaze upon places in the presence of others, other tourists or locals, as most tourist places are busy public um, uh, places. And as I said, gazing are also performed with significant others. And one, so to say, kind of team or family or group of friends afford some ways of seeing more than others. Gazing is kind of relational and communal. It also involves negotiations about what to see, how to see it, and for how long time. And gazing within a given place depends as much upon the quality 
of the social relations that travel along with tourists as upon the place itself. So if you have been to Paris with your partner and you're madly in love, Paris is that romantic. If you are in Paris with your partner and your relationship is falling apart and you realize that not even Paris can kind of recapture that, you know, um, um, relationship, then it becomes a very different place. Doing on time. Okay, yeah. And we also bring out some of um, the kind of the relationships between people gazing and those being gazed upon. So the eyes of gazers and gazes are likely to meet, however briefly each time the tourist gaze is performed. And earlier moments of the tourist gaze stress that tourists exercise much power over the places, and that kind of locals became the mad ones behind bars, you know, looked upon by tourists, rendlessly gazed upon and photographed. And indeed, various studies shows that the tourist gaze can, um, yeah, can create feelings of being kind of constantly watched and being objectified. Yet the 3.0 version also discusses how gazes or those being gazed upon are not necessarily passive and powerless. They can also exercise power and objectify visitors through their, their kind of gaze. And here we are kind of discussing notions such as the local gaze and the mutual gaze. That kind of brings out the resistance and power of host when interacting face to face with tourists. And particularly like um, a study by, by, by Meos, um, and where he's kind of describing how host might kind of exercise what he called um, open resistance, where kind of locals strike back at ignorant and obnoxious tourist behavior through kind of verbal confrontations, written instruction, and kind of banning tourists from entering certain places. And such resistance, I think this is really interesting, uh, to tourists are commonplace, especially in countries and settings where hosts are less dependent upon income from tourists. And host and guest are more or less on kind of equal footing in terms of social, cultural and economic capital. Um, and I think, um, and I think this is, is again coming back to the kind of literature on the new urban tourism. I think this is really relevant here. Um, here, tourists might be met with poor service and inhospitality. Once off the beaten tracks, tourism are openly resisted, mocked, and excluded, or they can be, because tourism can be seen as representing the commercial superficiality or because tourists are seen to be unruly and noisy. Um, at the time I was doing that chapter for um, the tourist case, I was in Berlin, and I was out in Kreuzberg, and um, I came across a squatted house, and it was actually my idea to go into that squatted house to have a beer, but the sign outside that squatted house, I don't know if I have it here, um, said, why is it called the tourist season when we are not allowed to shoot them? End of quote. Moreover, as discussed in the new urban tourism literature, tourists are blamed, and I think this is very much the case, for example, in Barcelona and Berlin, are blamed, right or wrong, for causing gentrification and rising rent and property prices more generally. Tourists are not always met with kind of open arms. And as a consequence, I think many tourists are trying to hide their true identity by not wearing cameras and maps, try to mingle with local crowds, eat where the locals eat, and invent stories about their more than touristic relationship with the visited places. I'm not like the rest of them. Of course, this is a risky game because there's always the risk that 
one's true identity are being exposed. All right. So 10 more minutes, is that fine? Okay. So I have argued that I'm now I'm kind of moving into my new stuff. So 10 minutes about that. Um, so, um, so the tourist case kind of brings out the crucial visual nature of many tourist experiences and tourist in environments. Yet, it has never been the attention um, to argue that vision is the only sense through which tourists encounter places and that tourist, the tourist case can explain all forms of tourism. That would certainly be a very one-sided and indeed perverse claim. As I said, tourists encounter places through a variety of senses. And I think much of my own work um, since we published the tourist case has in one way or the other moved beyond the tourist case in the sense that, as I said in the beginning, it has kind of explored people's multi-senses encounters with places and landscapes. And this is something I have done in relation to, more recently, in relation to cycling and running. In many ways, I think gazing is an ill-suited metaphor for understanding cycling and running because it's very much tied up with kind of somatic and kinesthetic experiences. Uh, at least that seems far more important than kind of visual um, apprehension of places. And yet, in, um, in, in a recent study on, on, on tourists who are cycling in New York, it was also clear in their account that that cycling somehow opened up um, the landscape and, you know, cycling at least at, uh, at a long kind of designated cycling route opened up kind of New York to a kind of a, a lovely mobile gaze. And um, next week I'm off to Kyoto and Tokyo um, to study marathons, so that's kind of what I'm writing about at the moment. And it's really interesting because in many ways, I don't know if any of you guys have been running a marathon, but it's a very kind of very tactile, it's, it's, it's staunting and you become so tired that you're hard to see anything. And, um, but, but nonetheless, almost all marathons are promoting themselves as being incredibly uh, uh, being places that are designed according to, um, to, to a certain degree, the tourist case in the sense that it kind of in, incorporates uh, tourist places. They are saying that, you know, we have the most kind of sightseeing friendly kind of route and so on and so forth. So there's definitely also an element of sightseeing to these events. And it's interesting because also uh, urban marathons are attracting an incredibly amount of, 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 in particular, kind of middle-aged men and women who's traveling long distances to participate in these races. So they are in themselves becoming highly uh, significant um, um, tourism events. Um, but, so while it may be the case that more and more tourists are gazing upon the wall while they are, are, are running, my argument would be that gazing does not overrule the other senses in, in cycling and running, or that runners and cyclists necessarily appreciate landscapes for their visual features. Um, they kind of appreciate them more for what they afford, so to say, bodily and corporally. And this is what I want to bring up. And here I'm really inspired by this kind of debates within geography, but about um, what is called non-representational um, uh, theory. And that is particularly interesting in relation to landscape studies, which is kind of the theme of this conference, because non-representational theory in relation to landscape is precisely trying to get away from the idea that landscape is predominantly something that we looked upon, okay? 
Non-representational scholars are against the idea, uh, against the widespread focus on re, uh, rep representation, rep representations, cognition, the visual sense, and discursive landscapes in the social science. They are instead detailing in on how social and cultural life is enacted and take place. Non-representational geographers study and theorize the enactment of physical landscapes, the expressive liveliness of more than human encounters and events, kind of multi-sensors practices, body-centered activities, and hard to communicate skills and less than fully conscious enactments. From a, from a perspective of landscape studies, non-representational theory challenged the represent, representational paradigm that for long, at least within kind of the social sciences, portrayed landscapes as discursive constructs and aesthetic images consumed through a kind of disembodied gaze. They argue for a much more kind of literally grounded understanding uh, of landscapes and lively being in the world. And some scholars use the metaphor of the sandcastle to highlight tourists' kind of proximate uh, multi-sensors dwelling-like engagement with the tangible yet porous matter of landscapes. Tourists are busy building and doing all sorts of things in the landscape, not unlike the farmer that dwell within the land for working with it. Giving their attention to biological bodies, they acknowledge that the haptic is also kind of in how we, we touch things. Uh, such somatic sensations are central to, for example, running, as it involves kind of intense embodiment that's getting hot and much heightened awareness of how bodies feel during and after running. Despite the fact that outdoor sport is a corporal practice per se, non-representational scholar Andrews claim that sports geography articulates, and I quote, static images of sporting landscapes. The feel fails to get to grips with the raw performance uh, of sport, sport as material, embodied, expressed, and sensed physical act happening in space and time, in the quote. So they kind of argue that we all geographers are neglecting the immediate and active detail of what is taking place, and they are arguing that, you know, researchers should make their methods dance a little and that you know, researchers should start you know, becoming like exercising and be active. And just to give a quote here, as Vanini is writing, the sensuality of non-representational ethnographies depends on a reawakened scholarly body, a body stiffened from long sleep in the background of scholarly life that now yearns to exercise its muscles. End of quote. Um, and now I want to end, because we're running out of time, so just skip a little bit. Um, I want to end on a bit of an experiment, and it's part of a chapter I'm writing at the moment, but it is based on a fieldwork on the Danish holiday island called Bonholm. And um, the event I'm writing about is a, um, is a running event on that island, and um, it's, it's, it's a tourist event in the sense that, you know, around 80% of people participating are, are tourists. They're mainly coming from, from Copenhagen. Um, it's a very, it's a very um, relaxed event. It's not, it's not highly competitive or anything like that. But it's, it's, it's a race that takes place over five days. And um, so in that sense, it's quite time consuming. And over the five days, you run like a full marathon. But um, as I said, it's, 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 it's attracting a huge amount of people. Some are, uh, are not really experienced runners and it's not extreme or anything like that. But what I'm finding really fascinating about the place is that firstly, 
uh, the kind of the landscapes of Bonholm is, is, is different to what you normally find in Denmark, which tend to be very flat. Um, and um, the race takes place in five different landscapes over the five days. And um, one race is the one I'm going to talk about today is taking place on a beat. But it's taking place in various kind of landscapes. And I'm like doing interviews with people, but I'm also running myself. And what is interesting here is how people talk about the landscape. Even though Bonholm is a very kind of, in many ways been seen as a very kind of picturesque, sublime landscape. And people are saying, yeah, we can enjoy the landscape visually. They're also talking about how running is kind of affording very particular, interesting, stimulating experiences of the landscape. So I'm very kind of interested in how, so to say, we are engaging with landscapes as we participate in these runners and um, how they kind of affect us. So um, if I have two minutes, I will make a little experiment. What I'm doing here, maybe I should just give a little bit of, of insight. It's a kind of autoethnographic vignette. So it's kind of involves me running as well. Okay, so this is like the second day. And this is um, on the beach in, 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 bon, in, uh, in Bornholm. And maybe if you're not a runner, running on a beach is, is very, very uncommon. It's very unusual to run in a beach, at least if you're living in Denmark. But it's very uh, unusual. Um, so it's a kind of, and it also involves running in sand dunes. So it's, it's pretty extreme in many ways. And um, okay, let's get started. Bang, we off, 2,000 primed runners. Ahead is the most feared and talk about of all the stages amongst the interviewees. The infamous 5.6 kilometer beats and sand dunes run in Dual. This is not the usual quick start. I immediately sense how the soft pure sand under my feet remorselessly absorbs my feet and makes every, make each of my steps feel very he uh, heavy and stranded. This is the opposite of flying that we did the day before, and lactic acid kicks in immediately. The afternoon sun has already dried out the morning rain. My pulse is running crazy, despite the fact confirmed by my watch that I run significantly slower than yesterday. We make a small detour and run towards the waterside with harder and safer ground underneath and our gait immediately increases. However, dangers lurk here too. Waves roll in, making our lightweight shoes wet and heavy. While newly built sand castles and canals, and canals by Hoditing families make the terrain dangerous. We zigzag around them, or jump over them, um, try to avoid an injury. No one seemed to care about the same castle. Yet we constantly run into or fall down into them. We are literally running on sand castles and our human feet and not the natural rhythms of the tides prematurely destroy them on this day only. All my attention... Oh, uh, the, the sand castle would be fully demolished before the, the slowest runners arrive. All my attention is to devoted to um, racing in this unusual terrain. And I hardly sense the surrounding beaches and the families that lick up the last sun and build the last sandcastle of the day. However, in passing, I notice one family that looks generally perplexed at the running spectacle that unfolds in, run, in, in front of them. Yet, it would only get worse. A rhythm brutally overwhelms us when we run into some high-rising sand dunes. Many begin to walk. It simply feels wrong to run in, a sand car, in, a sand car, in, the, in the sand dunes, and our legs feel tons heavy. Others sprint by me with light feel 
with light feet and small strides? Are they locals or just highly skilled runners? Their footwork and gait is in conjunction with the terrain. Yet the worst is to come. Just before the end, there's a steep sand dune where photographers and spectators congregate to watch this human spectacle of suffering. To our energy depleted bodies, they appear almost vertical. And I whisper to myself, don't walk, don't walk, dig in, dig in. I ascend in a blurry haze of exhaustion, vocal support and blitzing cameras. Did I manage to smile? The end disappears in a few hours, leaving only tens of thousands of footprints behind that will soon be washed away by the tide, rain or wind, or the next days in flocks of holidaying families. Maybe I should say that this, this chapter is also um, um, inspired by my recent work with um, Tim Eden on, kind of on, on, on rhythms and, um, and tourism. So there's also aspects of that. So the conclusion, I've, I've tried to kind of give you an account of uh, the history of the tourist case and how it has kind of changed over the time and how it also reflects John's intellectual kind of trajectory and how I think John ended up um, being very pessimistic. And, and I guess also kind of to tie into what Dean McKenna was talking about earlier today, um, the need to, to rescue tourism from, so from, from kind of brutal and vulgar capitalism that is going to destroy what we all like, the, the, um, the ability to go to and experience other places. And lastly, I've tried to argue, and in many ways it's, it's kind of embarrassing, my argument here, because I was looking out the window and I saw like you know, families, you know, even today when it was windy, like playing in the sand, and it's, and it's clear in a place like here that tourism has always been about, you know, since this experience of being touched by the sun playing in the sand and the bodily experiences, but I think to, to a large degree they have been, been overlooked in, in much, in many studies. So that was my final words. Thanks for listening. Bien, eh, a Jonas Larsen se le ha presentado por parte de Fernando. Yo quiero añadir que hemos asistido a una brillante conferencia que nos ha aportado, nos ha enseñado las claves para entender las a, aportaciones de las tres miradas turísticas, 1.0, 2.0 y 3.0, y las reflexiones últimas de la experiencia de, de experiencia del propio Larsen sobre la reflexión de, de este tema. La mesa redonda programada eh, cambia de registro eh, de intención de tema, lo hace más amplio, y la organización con esta actividad lo que prevé es que eh, los participantes con un breve comentario, aporten algunos puntos de referencia sobre este tema, el tema de la mesa redonda. El tema de la mesa redonda, como eh, habéis podido leer en el programa, es la eclosión de un fenómeno nuevo, el turismo de la ciudad postindustrial. Por tanto, la eclosión de un, fenómeno, de un fenómeno nuevo, el turismo de la ciudad postindustrial. Y es sobre este tema eh, sobre el que eh, pediremos a las, al profesor Larsen y al profesor Vera Rebollo que eh, nos aporten estos breves comentarios que nos van a servir de referencia. Al profesor Larsen se le ha presentado anteriormente, al profesor Fernando Vera... Yo puedo decir simplemente con cuatro palabras que es un referente en la investigación española en, sobre turismo y en la formación universitaria sobre turismo y que eh, no hace falta decir nada más eh, porque es ampliamente conocido por, el, por los presentes en esta sala. 
Bien, eh, centrándonos en el tema de la mesa redonda, mmm, me atrevo a plantear dos preguntas al profesor Vera y al profesor Larsen, eh, a los dos. Dos preguntas y después, eh, si tenemos tiempo, que espero que sí, daremos la palabra a, os daremos las palabras a, a vosotros en la medida que, que sea posible. Las preguntas, eh, yo parto de la premisa que nos interesa saber más sobre la eclosión, de un, de, de la eclosión del turismo en la ciudad postindustrial. Nos interesa saber más de aquello que ya está escrito sobre el turismo urbano, el turismo en la ciudad y la ciudad postindustrial. Se han escrito muchas cosas y eh, vamos a a solicitar a los participantes, al profesor Larsen y al profesor Vera, que nos den sus opiniones como un avance eh, a, a lo que ya se ha escrito. Entonces, eh, voy a hacer dos preguntas. La primera de ellas es muy básica, pero es eh, entendiendo todos lo que, eh, lo, eh, eh, asumiendo todos nosotros que se ha producido una eclosión de este fenómeno nuevo que denominamos turismo en la ciudad postindustrial, la pregunta que hagan los dos profesores es eh, si nos puede indicar brevemente eh, dos, tres factores, razones, por las que se eh, ha dado, por las que ha tenido lugar esta eclosión del turismo mm, en la ciudad actual, que calificamos como ciudad postindustrial. Por tanto, eh, cuando queráis podéis... Eh, responder a, a esta pregunta que, que acabo de hacer. Gracias, Pablo. A ver, pero ahora un inventario de, de los muchos factores que inciden en esa eclosión. Creo que el concepto de eclosión está perfectamente adecuado para el propósito de lo que se trata en realidad. Para... Muchas gracias. Perdonad. Decía que hacer un, un inventario de, o explayarse en los factores, factores son muchos, como sabéis, incidentes, y influyen de una manera también eh, diferentes cada uno de ellos. Pero, a ver, yo mencionaría por lo menos nuevos hábitos entre los consumidores turistas, que tienen que ver con paradigmas socioculturales, señalaría renta disponible en origen y señalaría movilidad y accesibilidad. Y me quedaría haciendo hincapié, porque los dos primeros están muy claros, paradigmas de, 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 asociados a nuevas formas de disfrute del tiempo de ocio y demás, el tema de la renta disponible es clave para entender los desplazamientos por motivos de turismo y, y este tipo de cuestiones. El tema de la movilidad, la contracción del espacio-tiempo es determinante. El hecho de poder disfrutar a alguien que vive en una ciudad española de un puente en Praga con la facilidad que se, con la que se disfruta, en esa escala el tema de los enlaces, las compañías de bajo coste han propiciado que el, el turismo de corta duración, el desbordamiento sobre ciudades, alcanza niveles absolutamente eh, insospechados. Y también a escala, a escala país. Fijaos, por ejemplo, el efecto AVE en la movilidad extrema que se produce entre ciudades, no solo por temas de, de negocios y demás. Esos factores son fundamentales. Influyen muchísimo en, esos, en, en estas cuestiones también los eventos. Los eventos han servido para posicionar ciudades, pero han servido también para reposicionar y para activar muchísimo los, los movimientos hacia ciudades. Y, por supuesto, influyen también otras cuestiones como son la promoción de los destinos y el efecto que está teniendo toda la cuestión de las llamadas plataformas de la economía colaborativa, para algunos no tan colaborativa, a la hora de activar una enorme bolsa de alojamiento en las ciudades a unos precios absolutamente asequibles, por decirlo así. Si vamos conjugando factores, entendemos ese desbordamiento. Y lo que es evidente es que no se ve como un fenómeno que se pueda parar y que se pueda de alguna manera o que se vaya a minorar en los próximos años, más bien se incentiva. Si tenemos en cuenta todo eso, pues también consideraremos la necesidad de las ciudades de regular estas cuestiones, que eso lo podemos ir discutiendo después. Muy bien. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I had some problems, so um, didn't hear all of it. Um, but um, it's, it's clearly a really interesting and difficult question to, um, to answer. And I think it, it's, 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 it will be a, a combination factors that can explain that. Um, I think I would like to kind of bring out, of course, the significance of 
of the kind of the infrastructure, the system that is now in place in terms of really cheap travel, uh, budget airlines, and um, they are of course like landing and taking off in many of these kind of post-industrial cities. So it is incredibly easy, cheap, convenient for any person almost to travel within most of, um, of Europe. So these places have more or less become weekend playgrounds um, for um, a whole generation of young and not so young people. So I think that is, is really important. Then I think um, the whole move to what's kind of Airbnb um, has also again made it easier, cheaper, more available, acceptable, um, and also of course opened up new spaces both between cities, but also in cities that are now open to tourism. And of course that is both an opportunity, but it also can be deeply problematic. And I think that is partly what I try to discuss in my talk today, um, the kind of classes that can happen when suddenly your neighbor is a tourist that does not really need to go to bed at Monday at 11 but think it's okay to, to party, for example. So I think there's going to be issues around that. Then I think it's interesting, I, I think in, in generally, this kind of move towards kind of city tourism, there's so much literature on, on tourism, just going back a decade or so, that was kind of this idea that people were fleeing the city and going to the countryside or whatever. Okay, this idea that, you know, you know, when we go on a holiday, we would like to to relax, um, to get away from the city. But um, cities, I think, are increasingly being seen as places that you move to, um, and also seen as places that are, are nice to go on a holiday. So there's something about cities in general that are seen as attractive, as kind of fashionable and all that, which were not the case uh, 20 years ago. Think about a place like Copenhagen, it's, it's the same in places like Barcelona, it was places that no one would left 20 years ago. But now they're places where not only people are coming as a tourist, but also like to live. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sí, ya acabó, acabó su intervención. <laughs> sí. eh, bien, eh, en los dos casos eh, se, entiendo que se ha puesto énfasis por una parte la movilidad, y los desplazamientos, las infraestructuras, el coste. Por tanto, eh, son, entiendo, causas o factores asociados a la demanda y a la posibilidad y capacidad de, de moverse. La Sena ha, ha añadido también al final el tema de la atractividad, los atractivos de la ciudad. De la ciudad. En relación a, a lo que acaba de decir el Larsen y, y su vinculación con su intervención anterior, Hago la segunda pregunta también, que es ya no el por qué hay eclosión del turismo urbano, sino el, la afectación del turismo a la ciudad, es decir, cómo el turismo transforma la ciudad. Y, y eh, en ese sentido dos cuestiones concretas, eh, cómo se tiene que gestionar la conservación de los elementos formales y funcionales de la ciudad y cómo se tiene que conservar la convivencia en la ciudad, a la que se ha hecho también referencia antes, a la hablar de confrontación entre anfitrión y turista. Cuando queráis, contestará cómo el turismo transforma la ciudad, qué se tiene que hacer para gestionar la conservación de los elementos formales y funcionales del espacio urbano y también la convivencia entre anfitrión y eh, turista. Habría que volver a insistir como punto de, de análisis de todo lo que has dicho, Paco, el turismo es un fenómeno de demanda. Hace muchos años que venimos insistiendo en que por mucho que desde los campos como el nuestro, el del urbanismo y demás, se estudie desde el lado del, de la oferta, por decirlo así, o de los destinos, es un fenómeno de consumo. Y esto hace que las, las pautas y demás vengan dadas a partir de lo que son los hábitos y los cambios en, lo, en esos hábitos. Partiendo de la base de que es un flujo yo voy a decir incontenible, ¿no? yo creo firmemente que la posibilidad de conservar la identidad del medio urbano, los valores que hacen atractivo ese medio urbano para el consumo turístico, va asociada, a mi modesto entender, necesariamente a la regulación. 
guste o no. Tiene que haber regulación. A ver, yo aquí, permitidme que me moje directamente, creo que hay como dos posturas antagónicas, hay muchas más entre medio, ¿no? pero hay dos posturas antagónicas en este sentido de la regulación. Una de corte neoliberal, en la cual cuanta más gente venga es mejor, es, ya lo hemos vivido en otros modelos turísticos, sobre todo los que nos hemos dedicado al ámbito del turismo costero, el turismo litoral, lo sabemos, cuanto más vengan mejor, con independencia de niveles de gasto y demás. Pasa igual en el medio urbano, cuanto más vengan mejor, ¿por qué regular? ¿Por qué se le van a poner puertas al campo? Y una postura en el otro extremo, que es la de rechazo visceral, que conduce a posiciones que todos conocemos por manifestaciones recientes. Es curioso también que dentro de la posición neoliberal luego sí hay reacciones de intento de regulación cuando me afecta a mí en mi modelo de negocio. Es decir, ahí sí que ves cómo el lobby hotelero quiere regular los apartamentos y la eclosión, voy a volver a utilizar lo de eclosión, la eclosión del apartamento y de las viviendas de alquiler porque me toca a mí en mi modelo de negocio porque es una oferta desleal. No deja de serlo, evidentemente todo, todo lo que está en el mercado debería estar en igualdad de condiciones, pero eso es otra cuestión. Por tanto, primera cuestión, hay, yo creo firmemente que hay que regularlo. Lo que pasa es que hay formas de regular las cosas. Hay maneras, como bien sabemos, de regularlas de una manera drástica y hay formas de disuadir y hay maneras de pautar esos niveles de saturación en determinados momentos. Segunda cuestión al hilo de eso, para ver cómo amortiguo estos efectos. A mí me da, después de, de años ya dándole vueltas a estas cosas, que los instrumentos normativos son, se quedan eh, limitados. Los instrumentos normativos específicos son insuficientes. Este problema que, está, que se está poniendo de manifiesto, de la, el desbordamiento de visitantes en estructuras urbanas que dan para lo que dan y que se ven de alguna manera pues, absolutamente superadas, yo creo que con instrumentos normativos específicos no se, no se consigue contener y no se consigue abarcar todas las facetas. Hay muchas facetas de este tema, pero creo que los instrumentos normativos pueden ayudar, pero no son la solución para todo. Me refiero que a golpe de ordenanza, a golpe de instrumentos de, de planeamiento, etcétera, etcétera, no creo que contengamos todo lo que hay aquí. Creo que hay medidas que conciernen a políticas, no solo turísticas, afectan a tráfico, afectan a movilidad en la ciudad, dentro de la propia ciudad, eh, y afectan a muchas más cosas. Y tercero, hay una lectura en esto que creo que también merece la pena sacar a colación. Si destinamos dinero público a adecuar los recursos turísticos de la ciudad en esas partes de la ciudad que son las partes visitables, la ciudad escaparate, ¿no pensáis que también hay un problema con que se destinan muchas sumas de dinero o se destinen cantidades de dinero a eso y se haga en detrimento muchas veces de las políticas de barrios y que se generen con eso desigualdades internas también en la ciudad? Y que eso lo he visto y me lo han contado en algunos planes estratégicos la gente que cuando haces una reunión y cuando organizan mesas de trabajo te dicen todo se va a la ciudad escaparate la ciudad escaparate lo, lo, lo atrapa todo, se lleva, polariza las inversiones y, mientras tanto, hay problemas latentes en otros lugares de la ciudad, en esas periferias urbanas y metropolitanas que no se quieren ver, porque eso no es la ciudad turística, eso no es la ciudad de la mirada turística. No creo que cuando vamos a Madrid nos vayamos a Usera o al Puente de Vallecas. Normalmente, cuando uno va de turismo, pues ya sabemos que va al Madrid de los Austrias. Lo digo esto de Madrid por no poner siempre a Barcelona, siempre estáis con Barcelona, hombre. Bueno, bueno en fin, regulación sintetizando regulación, segundo, insuficiencia de instrumentos normativos, porque creo que son más cosas. Por supuesto, creo que sí que hay que contar con instrumentos normativos, pero más cosas, más allá de eso. Eh, por supuesto, acuerdos eh, entre agentes actuantes. Eh, a la hora de hablar de los agentes intervinientes tiene que haber más acuerdos y más posiciones de consenso y menos posiciones enfrentadas entre gremios. Los gremios a veces se particularizan las cosas de una manera excesiva. Y tercero, el problema de los desequilibrios internos dentro de la propia ciudad. La ciudad es caparate contra la ciudad más global. Gracias. Um, I think that was um, really nicely put. Um, I think what I would like to add here and um, is it's not so much in terms of regulation because it's not really my fear, but you know, I think it's in incredibly Im important and needed and it needs to be regulated and we need to find a clever way of doing that. But what maybe because I'm speaking mainly here from a Danish perspective where we're not yet in a place like Copenhagen overrun by tourists and there's not really that kind of hatred against tourism as I'm seeing in other places. But what I'm finding really inter interesting and um, what we need to do in tourism study is 
paying much closer to attention to precisely how tourism impacts on our cities. And therefore, I think it's crucial that tourism studies get out of the small circle of tourism studies and try to engage with and collaborate with urban scholars who is still thinking, at least in places like that are not fully dependent or as dependent on tourism, that tourism is not really interesting and it doesn't really, does not really have a impact on our cities. So I'm really seeing the need to kind of expand that, having much more kind of research, kind of detailed ethnographic, qualitative, quantitative research on that relationship and teaming up with um, kind of urban studies. I think tourism ought to be kind of at the forefront. Also, I think what is, I think is quite disturbing actually is kind of some of the rhetoric. Um, it's perfectly okay, even among many of my left-wing friends, to, um, to, to, to speak really harshly against tourists. And also that, you know, what, the kind of the slogan I had, why is it called the tourist season if you're not allowed to shoot them? So there's somehow this kind of rhetoric um, against tourists and I think you know living in a mobile world maybe I need to get used to the idea that maybe my neighbor sometimes is a tourist so I think that all these kind of issues around you know immigrants and stuff like that the next kind of issue might be tourism and finding ways in which to live and accept the other um, could be really really interesting at least that's partly what I'm trying to do in my kind of my next research project, trying to team up with urban people who, it's not really interested in tourism, but I think they should be. I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> Bien, eh, hemos hecho dos preguntas para introducir, desarrollar esta mesa, este tema. Tal como les había comentado, abrimos un turno de palabras breve, por favor, aprovechando que tenemos a los profesores Larsen y Vera, eh, para seguir profundizando sobre esta cuestión. ¿Preguntas, por favor? Sí. Eh. Vicente. Bueno, es un tema interminable, lógicamente, y ha sido parte de muchas de las ponencias de esta conferencia y las que seguirán. Vamos a ver, eh, hay dos cosas de fondo, y tú, Fernando, lo decías... El mezcla, ya decía, Jonas, mezcla ya hablar de estudios urbanos en general, donde entra la sociología, donde entra la economía, la arquitectura, todo. Claro, en el tema de la regulación, la idea es no solamente los centros urbanos, porque incluso en Málaga, cosa que no sabéis los que no sois de Málaga, los propios hosteleros han pedido que se declare el centro de Málaga zona no residencial, evidentemente para no tener ningún problema con ruidos o cosas de estas. De hecho, el centro de Málaga, que tenía hace 15 años cerca de 30.000 habitantes o que en veintitantos mil, ahora tiene menos de 5.000, porque el resto son todas las cosas que sabemos. Y ahora la segunda parte respecto a expandir, y en Barcelona es un debate más largo y en Madrid ya, evidentemente, a expandir el fenómeno turístico al resto de la ciudad para que los barrios... ¿eh? se beneficien también de ese fenómeno turístico. Pero ahí viene la segunda pregunta y se la paso a Jonas la segunda pregunta. Claro, lo expandimos al, al resto de la ciudad, pero si al final hacemos la ciudad igual, por ejemplo, en Bestenborg, donde vive él, los, él decía que los, los, incluso los lugares, digamos, alternativos de comida o lo que sea, son iguales que los lugares alternativos de comida en el este de Londres o en un barrio de Málaga. Entonces, eh, no, ese esa atractivo de la ciudad, eh, que sí lo tienen los antiguos centros históricos porque tienen ciertos elementos constructivos que son la, la foto de esa ciudad, los nuevos desarrollos turísticos en los no centros de las ciudades son exactamente iguales en Bestenborg, en Barcelona, en, en, en Barcelona, en, el, en la expansión de Barcelona 
a, a Badalona, ya terminó. En el San Pedro IV, que, Tucuar, que ahí hay un debate precisamente que hacer con las antiguas industrias, es exactamente lo mismo que hicieron en las antiguas industrias del este de Londres, que son bastante trendies. So, ahí tenemos la gran contradicción. Ya lo dejo ahí porque es un debate largo. Muy bien. Dices bien, querido Vicente. Pero a ver, en el primer tema, la pérdida de la densidad de residenciales en centros de ciudad me parece un solemne disparate y conllevaría la musealización o museificación del centro de la ciudad. Eso estamos ya hartos de estudiarlo. Bueno, lo han estudiado muchos autores. Está más que, más que puesto en evidencia y creo que eso sería, insisto, un disparate. Es decir, a medida que tú eh, consigues levantar por decirlo así, la, la, la función residencial, haces que ese barrio o ese centro o ese distrito se convierta en eso, en un puro escaparate, eh, en un mero artificio. ¿no? Es un artificio que en el momento en que le quitan la vida le quitan muchas cosas. Creo que esto está fuera de discusión. Por lo menos yo ahí no, no, es que no entraría al debate ya. Yo a estas alturas cada uno ve las cosas desde su ángulo. Comprendo que quien defiende esas posiciones lo defiende porque tiene unos intereses muy concretos. Por eso le decía que dentro de las posiciones neoliberales en el turismo, luego es curioso porque te encuentras estas contradicciones tan solemnes. ¿no? Y de la otra parte que dice, yo me, solamente sé que se lo ha formulado la pregunta a Jonas, pero sí que quería decir en ese sentido que cuando yo me refería al tema de, del turismo en una, parte, en una parte concreta de la ciudad, que es la ciudad escaparate, que éramos lo no, y el hecho de que los barrios eh, se quejen, pues es por el tema de inversión, no tanto pensando en que el turismo vaya a ir a parar a lugares que no tienen en sí mismos pues, unos atractivos para la mayor parte de los consumidores turistas. Eso es evidente. Y que cuando se ha producido la salida de una parte del turismo de ese centro, de ese distrito central, ha ido a parar a lugares que son artificios creados con esa finalidad. Volviendo al caso de Madrid, para equilibrar con Barcelona, pues el caso de las rozas, por ejemplo, con el, el famoso LED o cosas por el estilo, ¿no? O los parques de ocio que se configuran en, en el entorno metropolitano. No sé, yo tampoco quiero explayarme. No sé. ¿Me pasas? Gracias. Sí, yeah, um... I'm, I'm quite interested in, uh, as I said, the kind of the new, uh, what is called new urban tourism. Um, and I, I guess the idea here is, as we've talked about, that increasingly people are venturing, you know, off the beaten tracks into neighborhoods that are not kind of designed as such for, for, for tourists. Um, but somehow, I don't think we should get kind of carried away believing that is, it is necessarily a kind of a search for the extraordinary. Because what, what, what I think that is, is ground to believe is that many of these people going into these spe specific neighborhoods are doing precisely, precisely the same type of people going into specific areas in, in Barcelona, they're going into specific areas in New York, Copenhagen, and they precisely like to go there, not because it represents something new at such, but because they can't kind of feel familiar with them. So there's that kind of, kind of sameness to it. What I'm also finding... Sorry? It's done? No, más cerca de la... Más cerca de la boca. Okay, closer. Okay, sorry. Yep. Sorry. And also a sorry. really interesting, uh, something I think that ought to be... Um, research much more is the kind of effect it has that tourism becomes more spread out. I'm not necessarily arguing that it is a good thing because, you know, firstly, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be more income generated. And secondly, it might also have the effect that areas that were not had to deal with tourism will now have to do it. So I think it's a really interesting issue. Um, but of course, lots of it has to do with Airbnb. Um, and um, tourism these days seems to be everywhere. And also because, like as I talked about, um, more and more people are mobile and then um, also hosting guests and so on. Yeah. Muy bien. Uh, Más preguntas, por favor. ¿Quieres tú? Una pregunta más, por favor. Que nadie se sienta cohibido. Bien, eh, tampoco vamos a, a, a provocarlo ni, ni a... 
Pero eh, es un tema este, apasionante, como todos los temas de Mesa Redonda del, 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 del primer Congreso Internacional, y se había programado para media hora y hemos eh, empleado media hora. Eh, creo que mm, lo que aquí hemos oído pues, es una, u, unas opiniones que, que nos estimulan, nos motivan a pensar sobre el tema y, y abrir la reflexión y el tema. Es decir, que no cerramos nada en absoluto, sino que nos llevamos sugerencias muy interesantes para reflexionar sobre el tema y continuar eh, estudiando este, este tema tan apasionante. Muchas gracias al profesor Larsen y al profesor Vera. Y eh, por mi parte lamento y disculpo que me tenga que, que desplazar a Barcelona rápidamente ahora. Buenas tardes y a seguir. Gracias.